The politics, politics, politics. Oh, wait, hold on. Here, let me. Uh, YouTube, you get a little bonus. Look at that. The Politics, Politics, Politics podcast is brought to you, as always, by Patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. Support not only this show, but also my one mic show jury at Patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. Thank you to everybody who subscribed through uh, November into December, man. It's the holidays. Uh, I very much appreciate everybody who sticks with us. We got a bunch of really cool stuff coming up, including a brand new In Your House tour. So... Head on over, patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But you want to know what? My, my screen grab thing isn't working, and I can't show you guys. So what do you say we just get into the show? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to this, the Politic, Politic, Politic show. My name is Justin Robert Young, and I'm, I'm going to break this one to you guys. I'm recording this on December 3rd, so you're going you're gonna to listen to it and watch it on a different day, but I'm flying across the country during the normal recording time, and that means that I had the fortuitous uh, uh, a moment on Twitter a couple days ago where one of my favorite internet personalities, somebody that uh, beyond his talking ability is also a, a, a writer and, and somebody who has worked on a lot of really, really rad projects. He's uh, someone whose opinion uh, I very much highly value, randomly falls out of the sky and says, I want to talk about politics. And I'm like, well, geez, I can't possibly turn down an opportunity to talk to my guest today. He is the host of the Straight Shoot podcast, the world's smartest wrestling talk show. He is the writer and performer of Scald, the only story that matters. Those are two podcasts that you should absolutely get into your life ASAP, but he is also uh, a comic book writer, uh, uh, the likes of which uh, the G.I. Joe versus uh, a Street Fighter uh, miniseries, the new G.I. Joe series. Ladies and gentlemen, Aubrey Sanderson. Welcome to the Politics, Politics, Politics Ow! show, Thanks my friend. Thanks for having me, man. Listen, hey, I, I never realized until I hear somebody else say it. I got a lot going on, huh? Dude, you're cooking, baby. <laughs> Dude, thanks so much for having me. This episode brought to you by Synchronicity. Right? I know. There are no coincidences. None. Yeah, yeah. You want to know what? Maybe that's that's uh you know I, I've been reading nothing but all these like hot take long read articles about you know comparing Lost to Westworld. So uh, may, maybe maybe that. What a nightmare your life is. Ah, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> man. That sounds awful to me. You every fun? once in a, well, you know, it's either that or I'm I'm, I'm reading you know uh, uh, four thousand post Reddit threads about whether or not the Buck Twins will ever end up in NXT. Like you know, it's it's it, it, it's it's uh, the internet is a hellish minefield. You have very with... limited options. You're right. Exactly. So I might as well read the Vulture or the Atlantic four thousand word like, and this is why the hatch meant more than the looping robots. Anyway, oh, Jesus. Uh, so let's talk about something a little bit less controversial than pro wrestling. Uh. uh uh, professional uh, politics, uh, the world that surrounds us. Uh, you, you can't, again, this was not a setup, right? Like you all of a sudden just hit me up on Twitter. You're like, I got to talk about politics with somebody. This uh, is true. What, this is true. What? We used up our good material before we went on the air, but like I, my wife is really worn out of me just leaving. Like we have, we have like a back room where I, where I do most of my work yeah. and I'll just come out just how because i work from home i'll just come out all fired up and just <laughs> ready to talk about a thing and she's sick of it she's over it uh like and we, we agree it's not like we disagree but yeah uh no i i i, I need i got things i need to get off my chest i'm, I'm dying to yammer with somebody about politics stuff because there's so much going on right now uh all right well let let me frame kind of where well here i'll allow you to do it a uh, uh, frame where you are a. Uh, uh, Politically, like, like what, what is, uh, you know, what, what is the the most interesting element of what we have seen so far, uh, you know, in terms of of you identifying where you are on the political spectrum? Oh, um, here, look, look what I'm wearing. Here we go. For those of you listening to the the right, the right angle, yeah. Oh. For those of you listening to the show, Aubrey it's Citizen, it's my municipal waste shirt. It's my municipal waste <laughs> Donald Trump blowing his brains out shirt that I cut the sleeves off because I thought that. I thought he wouldn't win. Sure. And I thought that this. I thought this could just be a summer shirt, and then it would be done. 
Like, if I had known that he was going to win and I would need this shirt for the next, to last the next four years, I would have left the sleeves on it. So it was a little bit more versatile. Uh, no, man, I'm very, I'm very, very, very far left. Like, painfully, almost, uh, like, almost a parody. <laughs> How far left I am. A parody. Uh, but, but, like, I haven't, but I haven't, I haven't always been. Like, I grew up, I grew up in the South, in Richmond, Virginia, um, in kind of, like, a reactionary <laughs> environment okay <laughs> and you know it, like I, I, we weren't going to clan meetings or anything right sure <laughs> like, but it was very it was very conservative right it was a it was a pro bush household right um I, when i was in and just environment like where i went to high school and everything um so like it was it was a uh, it was an evolution but i don't know i'm sorry is this is, am i answering your question no am yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, no 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 this is good this is good uh so you uh you, you grew up in virginia and then I believe you you lived in what New York City uh, to work, and now you live in L.A. Right? Yeah, I moved to New York when I was eighteen for school. Um, and I went to NYU, which was like a very you know as, as you can imagine, it's a very liberal college. So that was sure. like kind of a kind of a real mind fuck to go from Richmond, Virginia to NYU. Yeah. Um, and even more so, I mean, I started school in two thousand and one, and so I was there for about two weeks before planes started hitting buildings. Wow, are um, we the same age? I guess we're the exact yeah, same so. age then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, because that was that was my uh, that was exactly my experience. I went to Syracuse, so upstate New York, but uh, but but yeah, no, exactly the same the same. So yeah, time it was a, yeah. it was a very I mean I don't know, it was a very weird <laughs> it was a very weird trying time. Um, but yeah, like as a result of just being in New York for four years, and like honestly, the biggest thing that pushed me left um, was after I left college, because even when I was in college, like I just. Um, I wasn't so much right or even centrist as I was just apathetic. Just because sure. I had had enough of it, and it was just, there was so much of it, and I was it was exhausting too. Being new to this place and seeing this place that I lived used as like a political chess piece all the time, and it's not like I was. And a lot of people from New York were very offended by that. I wasn't offended because I didn't have any connection to New York yet. Yeah, um, but it was exhausting, um, sort of having. Us so just 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 the the, the politics of nine eleven was was kind of what what framed your political mindset going forward for a while yeah i mean it it, it framed it in terms of like apathy right gotcha like it, uh what really pushed me left was getting a job um in 2005 i started working at marvel and then i left marvel and went to we in like 2008 and working in these like entry-level positions at you know at big companies at jobs that i was fortunate enough to have like i was, I was super fortunate to have and i um I, rec I recognize that. I was, but the thing is, I was fortunate to have any job. Yeah. Um, and those being jobs that a lot of people wanted, you know, you have less, um, you have less bargaining power, right? Because there's so many, there's there 20, when you're an editor, there's somebody, comics, someone, someone's going to take your seat if, if you want to bitch exactly. about how hot it is, right? Exactly. Exactly. So that was like, <laughs> that was more formative me. More so than like four years of like taking classes with like Marxist professors and like yeah. and then, like and meeting like radical cheerleaders on the campus of W or uh, of NYU and stuff like that. More than anything, what pushed me left was how miserable it is being a young person trying to work a job in the you know in the two thousand eight era economy. Yeah, um, and like everything just kind of clicked in the place of how um, I don't know how broken that all is. <laughs> And that's and, and like and like it's yeah it wasn't like some kind of crazy like epiphany of like oh you know we need to take care of each other and do and do better by each other it was really actually it was very like self serving yeah right? this notion of like well I I don't have any way to get over right like I don't have any way to stand up for myself um, against the bosses against yeah. the guys who run shit and I realized oh it's because the, our country doesn't have unions anymore and that's yeah. it you know like that's that's that is the the bedrock of the problem and it drove me ex very very left very very quickly <laughs> very quickly so you want to yeah. know what this is a great a great starting ground because the more that i have looked at this election that we just saw and we a have the gigantic upset in terms of how everybody was looking at uh, uh you know the numbers going into it uh, as much of it's an upset that we have somebody for the first time in our history that has had no government or no military experience in the White House taking the job, as much as this is totally unprecedented that, you know, we're now going to have to to take another look at the laws in terms of what kind of holdings you can have uh, as a president just because Donald Trump, I mean, this is in, in 
necessarily even a negative thing to say. It's just the system was not built for people like him. The, the safeguards were not built for people like him just in terms of his career path. What everything keeps coming back to hey, is... Hey, can I interrupt? Yeah. Because I think that... I think that, like, this is a thing that I've seen a lot of that I'm not sure if I totally agree with, this idea that Donald Trump is totally unprecedented, right? Um, and Because, I mean, if you think, like, who was more political, I mean, who was, the early, the early presidents were just as encumbered by conflict of interest political matters. And in fact, that's why, that's why George Washington and all these, and like all these early slave owning plantation running presidents yeah. became president because they, they built the entire system to benefit them and to keep slavery as an institution. So, I mean, like the idea of like, oh, sure. you know, like presidents with, um, uh, business entanglements, uh, yeah. presidents as like belligerent racist monsters. Andrew Jackson was our president. Right. Like uh, I think, and I think this is one of the things that's like poisoning the discussion around <laughs> Donald Trump is this idea that like he is totally unprecedented and un-American. And now I think Donald Trump is awful, but I think Donald Trump is also very indicative of a lot of stuff that isn't ex excruciatingly American. Yeah. Well, I mean, let, there, there is something to be said for whenever anybody wants to talk about something that is beyond the pale. You got to look at old Hickory, right? Like you got to understand who monster. Andrew Jackson was. Uh, uh, so anyway, but here, let me let me let me let me let me draw a circle around this, though, real quick. The feeling that you felt when you realized that I don't have a recourse against this system. Right. I feel drove this election and it drove this election on both sides of the aisle. It just so happened that the Republicans got their mini revolution out during the primaries and the Democrats wound up nesting this egg that came, you know, that, that, that cracked open. And much like the gobbledygooker was a tremendous disappointment for everybody else that was looking in great anticipation. So disenfranchisement, the idea that the system was not built for me. I feel is the story politically in 2016, not only here, but also abroad. Because I think that that was a lot of what we've saw, what we saw with Brexit. I think it's a lot of what you see in Europe right now is Bring just, the pan. yeah, the many facets of when's going to be my turn because we've written the rules for you guys forever. And I think this is also where the Black Lives Matter movement is. I mean, there is just a, a an, an idea of when do we get to hit edit on the Wikipedia article of America and start rewriting the rules so I can get a chance. I agree. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and I think that that's the, that's the driving emotion because it's true. It's accurate. Right. I mean, and that's, and, and like, from... but, but, but it can, but it can be true on conflicting ideas. You can, like, right. you, know, you know, cause, yeah. cause, cause the white working class union voters that did not show up for Hillary which is really, to me, the numbers, the, the, the persuasive argument for the election was that, hey, look, for whatever we want to talk about Donald Trump, right, and, and we can dissect him, and believe you me, we're all going to have four years to do it. So settle in, kids. We don't got to rush it all out at once. The story right now in the immediate aftermath is just that the lesson of Bernie Sanders was not fully heeded on the Democratic uh, on the Democratic side, when I was covering it for BitTorrent News, and I was at in Philadelphia, all the big yelling during the speeches, protests, where people holding anti Trans Pacific Partnership signs that were handed out by unions, and then the unions want to come back to you know uh, last week and tell Politico, um, I, I guess uh, man, we didn't really see that Hillary wasn't uh, popular with our people, we weren't able to mobilize them in, in the same way. Do you think that the Democratic Party? has drifted away from that idea, from the idea that, that the union worker can trust them. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think that, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that what we're, what we're talking about is uh, the country's in a pop, the world is in a populist mood and one party took advantage of it and one party didn't. Yeah. One party put forth an establishment candidate whose name had been dragged through the mud for the past 20 years and then got shocked when people didn't want to get excited about her. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the Democratic Party in recent years, if you know, if ever, like I don't even know how far you'd have to go back for this to be the case. Yeah. The Democratic Party isn't the party of the working people. It's the party of the unions. And that, that's a difference. There's a difference. Yes. And, and I think that, you know, like 
there are I'm sure I'm sure the union organizers were you know realized okay well let's vote for Hillary. I mean Hillary's the best option this is what we need to do but the the workers didn't feel spoken to and I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of talk and I've been guilty of it too just in you know my online presence and stuff and talk about like winning the white working class and and what went wrong and why the Democrats lost the white working class and that's important to discuss because of the way that our system is built because in a very real way that's who lost the Democrats the election because of uh, where the electoral votes are and things like that. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, I think the Democrats did a poor job of speaking to any of the working class, right? Yeah. Um, and they 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 chose they chose different wedge issues, right? Um, I think that you know there's that there's that New York Times article that everybody has gotten really really flustered about on all t- sides of things. It's like the end of identity politics or. Um, it's, 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 I forget the exact name of it, but it's, it's talking about how identity politics don't win elections, but they can lose them. And I don't really agree with that fully because I think that identity politics can win elections, but you have to look at the actual numbers of it. And so while the, while the, while the democratic party thought, okay, well, we can, we can target, um, we can target Hispanic voters and, um, gay voters and women voters and, um, and black voters and we'll build our coalition that way. Uh, the fact that like the numbers of the, the the way the country, the demographics of the country are still broken up. If you want to win an election, you still have to get you still have to get white working class to people to vote for you. It's yeah. just necessary. And like whether it's whether it's morally right or not, you still have to find a way to appeal to those folks. And to my mind, the way to do it, it, it seems entirely obvious. And it touches on what we're, I I was telling you earlier. It's labor. It's labor. Yeah. Right. It's it's a labor movement. It's something that cuts across all of those identity politics lines and actually addresses everybody involved. And I think the there's been a spectacular failure on the part of the Democrats um, to achieve that. And it's not like it's not like and I don't you know, I'm not sitting here telling you that the Republican Party has been any better because Donald Trump hasn't even taken office and he's been worse than anybody. You know, <laughs> he's, he's stacking his cabinet with the outrageously wealthy who are just going to line their pockets okay yeah well here let me let me let, let me ask you this this is something that, that i kind of uh uh had a had an epiphany about this week when donald trump says drain the swamp right forget that this is you know a a you know his his slogan right but let's just take the metaphor for you aubrey citizen what do you believe the swamp is if we want the swamp to be drained what is the metaphorical swamp. The swamp. So I'm a Bernie Sanders guy. So the swamp is campaign finance. The swamp is where people get their money and and where people are allowed to spend money to to get political movement that they want. Okay. So it's it's lobbyists. It's super PACs. It's uh, big companies being able to give as much money as they want to whomever they want. Uh, that's I mean. That to me, that's the swamp. That's the swamp. And the, okay, and the, so, and the so industries that have built up around and industries, like yeah, actual industries that have built up around allowing people to buy political clout. That's the swamp. It's got its own street. It's got it's got case. It's street. crazy to me. It's, it's, it's crazy. Own street. People talk about it like it's part of the it's part of the government, and it shouldn't be. <laughs> like like that that's horrible. Okay, so let's so let's let's drill down on that. The idea of a corrupt permanent DC class would that would that be would that be a a, a good larger kind of uh, a, a basket to put those frustrations in that the, the idea sure. that that DC is just a permanent place where these people like live out their entire careers to affect the leadership of the country absolutely so if that's the case and I think uh, what what to me has been interesting is that some people and I think even what Donald Trump is trying to speak to is kind of that is the idea that I want to impose term limits right I want to do this like I want to make sure the that rules these about things lobbyists turn like, over very, yeah that, that was very like like I don't know that was the most interesting thing about like looking at his like um I guess it was like the first hundred days plan yeah like uh, I don't, maybe not half, but there was like a significant amount of stuff in there that I read, and I was like, "Well, fuck yeah, do it. Term yeah. limits. Don't let don't let former staffers become lobbyists. You know, like don't get negotiate our way out of NAFTA. Fucking put a fucking bullet in the in the TPP. Like, yeah. it's 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 fascinating because like there's it's 
he's not a typical Republican. I don't know. I'm, I'm all over the place. Oh, no. He's a, I mean, he was a literal Democrat until like yeah. 10 years ago. And five years ago, he said he was very, 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 very pro-choice. I mean, the funniest thing about Donald Trump to me is that he really just is this Rorschach test for everybody on every side of the spectrum. The people that want to hate him will find any little thing, and, and it's there because he's him and he puts out so much, and you can find a way to make him the, this evil person. The people that are that are now, now going to be uh, uh, waiting in line to go to his thank you rallies over the next week or so, they all see stars in their eyes, even if they vehemently disagree with him on, on various things. I mean, Donald Trump is, at the same time, the guy who puts Breitbart News in in charge of deciding what he's going to focus on and is the first Republican candidate to hold up uh, an LGBT flag and have, you know, make mention that he was very happy that he had Peter Thiel, an openly gay person, speak at the convention. He's also just anti-free trade. Like, and he's, he's anti-free trade. anti-the free market. Like, yeah. He, like, there's just no way to, there's no two ways about it. Man, I think in a lot of ways, Trump's less terrifying than Pence is, right? Because Trump... Trump stands for, the only thing Trump stands for is Trump, right? Trump is going to, Trump and his pals, their, his cronies are going to line their pockets. They're going to do everything they can. You know, it's it's going to be a kleptocracy. Like I, I had, this was a 50 I had this week. Yeah. Uh, like looking at who he's staffing in the White House and looking at who he's putting on his cabinet, you know, as much as people on the right have like for, for 50 years now, more, more than that, have like clutched their pearls and wrung their hands about us turning into Russia and us like and falling to communism and and socialism and how that was that's what was going to do it and that's what's going to make us turn into Russia. No, what's going to make us turn into Russia is electing a bully strong man who builds uh, an apparatus by which all of his pals can get rich. I mean, that's what Russia is. Now Russia isn't communism. Russia is yeah, corrupt like quid um quid pro quo uh, you scratch your back, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and everybody makes money. That's what Russia is now, and that's what that guy's going to do. Uh, Pence is more terrifying to me in a way because Pence actually believes in some evil, despicable shit. I don't think Trump believes in anything. I just think he's he's, he's well, just, if, 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 yeah. If you look at what he's flip flopped on over the past ten years, you know it, it's you know pretty much you know the name name a thing and and Nothing. He's, yeah, you know, he believed in winning. He believed in winning and he believed in Donald Trump and he did it. And now he's going to just, you know, he's going to make himself rich. He's going to he's, he's going to have I don't mean to downplay the damage that he's going to do to the country and the republic because it is immense. Right. But it's I would be more terrified of Pence being uh, president, honestly. So but, but is part of that the idea that the establishment, which is uh, I mean, like, I'll tell you, it's one of those things where. uh you know, they uh, like at the end of the year, they always have like, oh, we're going to add these things to the dictionary. Like, establishment, wow, did that one blow up over the last, you know, uh, uh, you know, 12 to 16 months. All of a sudden, everybody had an establishment and everybody didn't want to be a part of it, right? You know, like it was just, it just went from a, a thing that kind of everybody vaguely understood to something that had a label and was being run uh, uh, against. What is the establishment for you, um, I mean, I think it's. I mean, I, I think it ties back into the same. Um, you know, I don't. I don't have the rage against the establishment that a lot of people do, because the fact of the matter is, Bernie Sanders, as much as everybody loves him and talks about him, like he's this. Um, and I love Bernie Sanders, and I was a Bernie Sanders guy throughout, you know, throughout the primaries. Um, but that guy's been a senator for how many years? That guy's as establishment as he, as they come. I think right? he like, I, I, th I think he got elected when Andrew Jackson was president. I, I think I think he <laughs> ran yeah, on an exactly. anti Jackson platform. That guy's not an outsider. He's been in, he's been in he's been in DC for decades. Uh, so I don't know. Like I don't think really. I don't think establishment in and of itself is the problem, and I think that's kind of what got us here is that you have enough people who are so frustrated with the system that instead of looking at what actually is broken about it and doesn't work, they just assume that it's the existence of the system in and of itself that is the problem. Yeah. When really it's institutions and it's the establishment. If anything's going to protect us from Trump, it's the establishment, right? It's, it's so who is, who is the establishment? Who, who... Well, I don't even know. When people say that, I don't even know what they mean. Like, I guess it is just anything in government, just the government. I mean, I think that that's, that's how, that's how the Republicans have, 
you know, made such progress and gotten so many votes is because there's just this general idea that government, the establishment is the problem and therefore government is bad and therefore we need somebody from outside of government to come in and solve it, which is nonsense. It's absurd. Well, it's also crazy that like, you know, man, we went from a month before the election, all I was reading were the death of the Republican Party think pieces, right? How demographically the, the, the country is aligning in a way for which we might have seen our last Republican president, right? Until two weeks later, all of a sudden I'm reading the same people write about the Republicans might have built an, uh, a, an electoral college death star, the likes of which the Democrats will never be able to go. It's like, I don't know where this uh, lands on just kind of me covering the coverage or if it's just that we as an as as a as a people have no idea like like are we where are we like like are, 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 is is it on one side is one party super powerful because it sure looked like they were doing everything they could to to river dance on their own dicks 5 seconds ago and now all of a sudden they're a super powered juggernaut that'll never be taken down yeah, it's nuts, man. I mean, I think some of it has to do with the kind of echo chambers that not just you and I, but everybody mm -hmm. lives in. And, you know, and, and also the the monetization of the news, right? And people, you know, if if a lot of people click on a think piece about the death of the Republican Party, you know what we're going to be doing next week? More think pieces about the death of the, of the Republican, Republican Party. Party. Yep. And, it, and it's it feeds on itself. Um, I think that's at play. I think what's at play was, you know, touch on what we talked about earlier, this assumption that, you know, we, we've got the unions, we've got the white working class, uh, but not just not just that. But I think there's a lot of assumption, you know, because voter turnout was down across the board. I think a lot of the the Democrat, the Democratic establishment, the sure. I'm using it, uh, the, uh, they just kind of assumed that the the groups, the coalition that they built up was sturdy and everybody would come out and do their job and do their responsibility. And they didn't. Yeah. They just absolutely didn't because they didn't they like the Republic the Democratic Party doesn't know how to win. Right? The Democratic Party knows how to Well they did. Uh, they did until uh, you know uh, six weeks ago, right? That was the well, whole but, thing. Was the, it was but, it was the machine, the blue wall. There was a wall. I mean, but they but they didn't. And even if you look back at 2008 and I'm oh, sorry, 2012 and 2008, you know, they won. And then what happened? They couldn't get anything done, right? Like, and, and this, this is a problem. Obamacare, Obamacare would be the big thing, right? I mean, that was, that was, that was the big signature achievement. And even that made nobody happy. That wasn't what anybody wanted it to be, right? Uh, yeah. Aside from like, you know, pre existing conditions and, and, uh, uh, well, yeah, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying like it didn't yeah. accomplish it. Dude, I no, don't no, have no. health insurance if not for it. Yeah. No, I, no, I, no, I no. But I, but I agree. I, I think it's, it's one of those things where at the end of the day, you look at it and it's like, Okay. The, the, well, drug, the drug companies and the insurance companies still get to make a fuck ton of money, right? That's not well, and And now they're a government-licensed oligarchy, you know? Yeah, like that, exactly. It's, so it, it's, it, like, it, it's like, all right, well, I'm really glad that we, that we ensured that all these uh, companies can not be competitive with each other anymore. And, and I, don't know, I don't know what it is, man. I, I, the, the left has a real problem where as soon as they get – the right wins and then they make shit happen. They get everybody in line and they move forward. Yeah. And the left doesn't. And the left, and I think part of it has to do with the left being people on the left being so in love with feeling morally right, which is why people like why there was so much like confusion and like just bewilderment over the fact that dude, I won, I think sixty dollars. Uh, I bet I made three different twenty dollar bets with people that Donald Trump was going to win. Um, and there because people were just like, no, no, of course not. There's no way. There's oh, no way. Oh God. I mean, he's, I mean we, he's, we, he's, we 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 happen to live in in. Bobby, two of the cities that that did that was very excited about Hillary, you know, both L.A. and, and the Bay Area were very, very, very much. They turned out in droves. They turned out and voted for her in, in a way that a lot of the other country, the rest of the country didn't. Uh, it was I remember I flew out the next day and I took the BART into SFO and it was I've, I've described this on, on the show before, but it was like a bomb went off like it was just silent. It was just weird. Like, like this it was the same city, way here. It was the exact same way. In this LA, city man. was it, not prepared for that. Like it was, it, it was, yeah, a it was shock. wild. And, and having grown up in, you know, and when I grew up in, so people forget Virginia is only recently a blue state. Virginia was a red state 
since always, right? Yeah. Um, when I was growing up there, and um, people just weren't prepared for it. Um, and I think that, you know, it's this this infatuation with feeling like you're morally right and just being able to pat yourself on the back for being right. I think this is part of the problem with the left too, is that instead of thinking about ways to win elections and ways to win and get shit done, it's all just kind of dithering about and bickering over <sighs> minutia and things, you know, and like, and here's, you know, like pick whatever, you know, uh, pick whatever like internet embroiling <laughs> uh, dilemma and, um, c catastrophe that had everybody up in arms from a few months ago, right? Yeah. Whether it's, you know, cultural appropriation or uh, how, you know, how you should ask people about pronouns or, and all this yeah. stuff that I, you know, you're right. I agree. Don't, cult cultural appropriation is damaging. Uh, use whatever pronouns people want to use. But every time somebody, every time a willing ally and somebody on the left who you should be on the same side with gets dragged on social media or just, dogpiled online for, I don't know, getting something slightly off. Every time that happens, it pushes people right. And it fractures what should be a meaningful coalition. And you don't see that happening on the right as much. And I'm not exactly sure why. Well, I mean, I would, I would probably, uh, I, I would, I would, Kind of disagree with you because uh, I, on the on the right side because when I was in Philadelphia covering the Republican convention, all I heard was angst and and anger. But I do think that there is an element that is a little bit more hardwired into the Republican Party at least that like they they do take seriously the big tent thing that it's like we don't have to agree with everybody. There's these kinds of conservatives and then these kinds of conservatives. Now that's got an underbelly. Because sometimes you wind up with people that are like, you know, it, it, you know, racist or or you know other things. That's that is a little bit more. I don't, I don't know. Tolerated is probably going to get me letters, but fucking, you know, that there is there is an idea that no everybody can disagree with everything as long as it's moving the whole party forward, right? And they still come out and vote, and they recognize and they it's go out and vote. They, they they vote and they recognize that you still need to win. And they come out for it. And it's just not a thing that happens on the left. And I think in an election like this, where it was so contentious and, um, you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, I don't, I'm not one of these people who, like, it really incensed me. It made me angry that a lot of, like, really, really diehard Hillary people um, early on in the primaries were saying that Bernie should just drop out so they could really, so they could not risk damaging just Hillary. focus, focus, yeah, come on. Yeah, he's got to focus on the one that I want to win, right? Like, I thought that was absurd. But, I mean... I'd be lying if I said I didn't think that the type of fight in the primaries didn't have a result on the lackluster turnout later um, because because people felt like they weren't being listened to. And those those folks who, you know, they, they did have these populist. So rather than anti-establishment, I'd rather I'd prefer the term populist. Right. Like they yeah. had these populist sentiments. And a lot of those folks felt they weren't being listened to and that. Hillary is another establishment corporatist neoliberal candidate, which she was, right? And as a result, they either, well, like more of them than any of us would probably like to admit, hop ship to Trump, even though that's psychotic. It's crazy. Well, right? I mean, like it's, 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 you know, it's either stay home or vote the other way and, and both exactly. are beneficial and, and a lot of, and a lot of i think a lot Trump. of them stayed home too yeah as well oh yeah as well because it just, no the numbers did. the numbers bear that out you know yeah uh, uh because uh all right well here uh, we got a whole half hour without me asking you what i'm sure you get a lot because i get it a lot just as a fan of professional wrestling people know that i'm a fan of professional wrestling you are a professional wrestling uh a, a voice a in, in the media a feet is the word i use right i'm sure you just get ad nauseum. Well, this is what is like professional wrestling and politics, or, or you know, the, the comparisons between professional wrestling and politics. Uh, uh, ad nauseum. Let me ask you two questions. Number one, Hillary Clinton. I, I I made the point on the last episode of this show that she is the greatest star maker in the history of American politics over the last fifty years. That the three biggest names that we have. That, that have exploded on the scene are Barack Obama, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump. And they all got famous going over Hillary Clinton. That Hillary Clinton was just, she's, she's, she's the Iron Sheik. She's, she's Rusev. She's whatever the-, the She's the, inherently unlikable. 
is what you're saying. Right? Well, like she's, according like she's to a, according to the, the votes, and and listen, like we can you can drill down on that, and you can come out with any uh, number of reasons, including misogyny. Let's let's understand that that is. I, I think that's one of them, but I think there are plenty of other ones too, man. Well, I mean, like at this point, you know, when when Rick Lazio is the only person that you could beat, <laughs> like it's it's like, well, you, you don't really got a good track record. Like like she's got she's got an abysmal one, also to the point where it's like it's not like she just gets beat. These people become institutions. They become yeah. presidents. They become you know uh, folk heroes. I think what's important to note, though, is that, like, I mean, and so it's it's tough. I'm glad you brought up the misogyny thing because it's tough to have this conversation because you can't fully decouple it, right? Because no. it's it's the, the misogyny. It's an instant. It's a um, baked in institutionalized misogyny that, like, even you know, you even see it in women voters, right? Like, everybody was shocked that so many women voted for Trump, and like, I don't know, I wasn't. Yeah. You know, like even even women have misogyny, like institutionalized the patriarchy. The patriarchy, man. The, this is the guy I am now. Well, right? I- uh, Listen, and, 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 th- and this is the point in the in the conversation where, as two good California podcasters, we recognize that we are two white guys in our early 30s and therefore are, are going to be coming from, from uh, a perspective for which can probably not understand the intricacies of misogyny as a female perspective would. So, so but, it, that, but it exists. But it exists. I mean, Absolutely. Any, any, feminist, any feminist will tell you that women also exhibit the... Um, the effects of kind of an institutionalized hegemonic patriarchy, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think we saw that. But, you know, I, I think something that's important to note about the three people that Hillary Clinton, <laughs> you know, laid down for, right? She, she <laughs> stared at the lights for the one, two, three, brother. Uh, yeah. Like the, the three people that she did that for, they were all populists, all three of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and like I, I, I read a thing a while ago, and I thought it was really, really smart, talking about how we couldn't have Donald Trump without Barack Obama, right? And I, I think of, so, yeah. I mean, and part of that is just kind of logistically because Donald Trump entered on the political scene by making his abhorrent claims about Obama's citizenship, his, right? Yeah, but it's... even beyond that, uh, Barack Obama made it possible and acceptable for a populist – uh, I wouldn't go so far as demagogue, but a a pop a populist candidate to win the you know to to take over the political party and win yeah right and and it made that acceptable and we were all, we we're all okay with it because we liked Barack Obama and yeah. we we're okay with him swooping into office upon you know you know because one of the things that people talked about Obama when they were excited for him to win it was hope right it was like a it was a shitty sh- shepherd fairy. <laughs> peace right and it was and it was the fact that it was the the first black president right yeah and those were the reasons people voted for barack obama not and, saying that guy and, didn't have a good track record but... and they were i mean there is a part of this and nobody wanted to hear this during the general election but barack obama got famous because he beat the villain the villain was Hillary Clinton. And now all of a sudden you roll her back eight years later and it's like, no, no, no. I'm the good guy now. It's like, that's the thing. That's the thing I thought was so crazy. Like as a wrestling fan looking at this shit, like we already saw Hillary lose. Like she was the she was the runner up. She was the loser of the last election. Why are you putting her forward now? Like that, like all that saying is that all that's saying to the, the, the people is that, well, we couldn't find anybody as good as Barack. So we're going with our second choice from last time, which is insane to me. But no, I think the populism thing is important to note is that, you know, the country, the world is in a populist mood right now. And the Democratic Party, instead of listening to that and heeding it, said, nope, it's Hillary's turn and everybody's going to get in line and you're going to you're going to come to heel and you're going to vote for her and you're going to be excited about it. And people said, ah, and just didn't. <laughs> and like, I. I don't know. Like, it, I find it kind of offensive that people are shocked by it. Honestly, I have a friend who, a friend who I kind of, I, I stopped talking to him honestly because in the midst of the primary stuff, we were chit chatting one day, and he told me like a, like a series of things that just made me so mad. One of them was, uh, well, Clinton wins. Hillary Clinton wins, wins elections. I mean, she's gonna win. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. She's gonna win the election. It's like, motherfucker, she. She lost the primary of the last one, right? She's got Lazio. She got Lazio. She beat Rick Lazio to be the senator of New York. And that's that's her record. That's it. And I told her, and I told him too, I was like, you know, I I think that they're really sleeping on class issues. 
class issues. This is what this is why Bernie Sanders is a better candidate because he's speaking to these class issues that are really important to people. And what he told me was there are no class issues in the United States. There are only race issues. And that's why and that's why they lost. That's like that's exactly why the Democratic Party lost. It's insane. It's crazy. And also like a failure to recognize whether it's fair or not, she is bundled up with a lot of hatred from the 90s and from her husband's uh, administration. And again, whether it's fair or not, doesn't matter if you're trying to win a fucking election. You don't put a losing horse out there. I don't know. So, I mean, uh, the, to, to go back to the wrestling thing, you made a really, really good point on the last episode of Straight Shoot, for which uh, I would encourage everybody to go listen to, uh, that wrestling storytelling is much like all storytelling, but specifically in, in kind of how you have to compartmentalize wrestling storytelling, the setting up of expectations and then either validating them or subverting them. And what during the the election, because now, especially when I did a, you know, I did a podcast where I'm on the record talking about all these things. Many of them were gloom and doom for Donald Trump's chances. I, I, I find myself clinging to the problem. I, I find myself clinging to any right opinions that I had just incidentally <laughs> throughout it. But one of one of the opinions that I uh, that I had was that I thought it was a very risky idea for Hillary Clinton to run her campaign specifically about how unelectable Donald Trump is, because right. all it requires is for him to stop foaming at the mouth on Twitter for five minutes. And all of a sudden, if it's like if the commercial is here are the 19 things that Donald Trump said that are horrifying and you just have all these commercials with Sarah McLachlan piano music and veterans with their arms cut off, shaking their heads slowly while they look at the television. And then it comes back to CNN and is Donald Trump saying something that you kind of agree with. Your message is destroyed. You've completely you know, your, your, your message is just toast. Uh, it, it's it, it's a specious kind of thing, whereas as ridiculous and, and broad as, like, Make America Great Again is, it's a simple story. Can sure. we do it? Vote. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, I, he he gets it. I mean, that guy, like, he's not a, like, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing the entire way, and everybody aided and abetted him and was complicit in it. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. I mean all of us talking about him and giving him attention and writing him off and thinking... You know, no, certainly not. Like, and he's, it's a joke. It's its a gag. Um, you know, all the media that gave him the all the, the airtime that they didn't give to other candidates just because they knew it brought the numbers in. Uh, it's, yeah, I don't know. We're all complicit in it, for sure. Um, because, the, and that guy played us like a fucking fiddle. Um, because that's, you know, it's something I said a while ago, like, was you can't turn the presidential election into a reality show and then be surprised when the reality show star wins. <laughs> like, yeah. like how, how could that surprise anybody? It's crazy. Uh, you know, it, it's it's something that I think we will we will long, long, long from now continue to be unpacking uh, uh, this election and everything that wrapped around it. What, when people do ask you the like, you know, like, oh, well, po politics and pro wrestling, like, what do you think are the elements that that do translate and and which are kind of overblown? Um. What I think is overblown is this idea that it's something new. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I think is overblown, right? I think it's always been the case. I think, you know, I central wrestling or uh, pro wrestling is so central to my aesthetic um, that I, I look at everything through that lens. Right? Yeah. I look at everything. And, and the way I look at professional wrestling is like a con, right? Um, and it's a con, you know, and every anybody knows anything about confidence games or has watched you know <laughs> the sting or like, yeah like just a movie about confidence games right uh you can't con an honest john yeah the, if you're gonna con somebody they have to be in on it they have to be they have to think that they're in on it they have to they have to want to be conned uh you're a magic guy it's yeah. the exact it's the exact same thing mm -hmm. you can't do a trick for an audience unless that audience wants to believe that that trick is happening right yeah. you, you have to you have to garden path them into it and i think that that's true in storytelling Right. Like if I'm if I'm writing a comic, if I'm writing an episode or an issue of G.I. Joe, I need you to want to believe that these static images on a piece of paper are real and to get invested in it. Yeah. If you don't, then there's nothing I can do to make it matter to you. So you have to be in on that. You have to be willingly in on the trick. Um, and I think that that's what politics is to a T. You know, it's a carnival barker. It's a guy, you know, even though, you know, in your head that you can't 
that it's you know that there's springs underneath of that basket, right? And that when yeah. you throw the ball into it, it's going to bounce right out of it. The way he speaks to you and the things that he tells you, it makes you want to believe that. Well, yeah, but if I if I throw it just right and hit the back of the basket, then it's going to bounce in. Then I can game the system. Yeah. And I think that that's how that's how wrestling works, right? By saying, listen, uh, yeah, 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 it's fake, but this is real. <laughs> but yeah. this part of it is real, right? Even though it's not, it's all fake. Or conversely, by saying, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. You understand how this works. And then completely switching the script on you and, and spinning things around. And I think that that's, I don't know, I think that's how all of human interaction works. And I think that it's, this last this last election cycle, I think it's been a little bit more obvious. But anybody who thinks that, you know, Barack Obama's campaign wasn't sitting down every morning and talking about how they were going to phrase things and how they were going to talk about things to manipulate various audiences yeah, the, and the get messaging, them to believe. Messaging is what they call it. I mean, like it's, it's marketing. Yeah. It's marketing. Yeah. Whether you call it marketing or a con, it's the same fucking thing. So I don't know, man. I think that I think they're exactly the same. I think everything is pro wrestling. That's me. Uh, <laughs> I think everything is just a big con and a big trick and you have to get people willing to believe it. And, you know, Donald Trump is a perfect example of that in that, he got people willing to believe that he could make, they wanted to believe that he could make America great again. And so it didn't matter what people said about him. It didn't matter what yeah. the facts were. It didn't matter what Hillary brought up. It didn't matter how many times he flip-flopped on an issue because people wanted to believe that that was true. And it was game, set, and match at that point. Well, I mean, I, I do think that there is a danger of us looking at this, like, and, and overblowing the results because this was an extraordinarily close election that was that was decided on very very thin margins. The fact that and she won and she won the popular vote too. I mean that's she did that's, she did because the coasts because where we live and and have lived like were wild about her right you know they they loved her you know it was one of those things that I I had to make a realization about myself when uh, you know after the election in terms of understanding my own biases to say hey look. The most conservative counting I ever lived in was uh, when I went to school in Syracuse when I was on a very liberal campus. Other right. than that, I lived in a liberal county in Florida. I've lived in liberal counties in New York City, and I lived in a liberal county. I live in the Bay Area, which is like. But this is, like, but I think this touches on what I was saying earlier. In that, yeah, like I mean, li uh, the Democrats won the uh, popular vote, and it was a close, you know, it was a close, hard-fought election. Um, but they still lost. Right. And the yes. reason they lost is because they failed to actually win where it mattered. And now it's a broken system. The Electoral College is fucked for a million reasons. Right. Not least of which being the fact that it has its roots in just protecting slavery. Right. <laughs> like from its very yeah. institution, it's a it's a nasty, nasty, lousy, unnecessary thing. Gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a thing that ha has happened and continues to happen. It's going to happen more over the course of the next four years. Uh, voter suppression, right? That's a thing that, that continues to happen. And all that's true. And people on the left like to point at that stuff and say, oh, yeah, so it wasn't really our fault and we won the popular vote and there you go. No, dummies. You have to know if the game is rigged, you have to know that going in and you have to play it accordingly. Yeah. Right. And that's and that's that's where the Democrats fucked up because they just assumed that because we're right. We're going to win and we're gonna, and we're just going to swoop into office. No, you have to look at actually, you know, it sucks. It's for people who live in California. It's a pain in the ass that a Wisconsin vote counts more than ours does. Yeah. It just does. Right. Because of the Electoral College. But if you're the Democratic Party, that's something you should realize. And that's something that you should play to. And they didn't. They failed to. And that's why they lost the Rust Belt. That's why they lost the election. Well, and that's the reason why I, I don't think that. I mean, granted. It was very, very thin. It happened to be four states that Trump won that were he was not expected to. Maybe Ohio, you know, so three were definitely big surprises. Uh, at, at the end of the day, anything could have affected it. But the reason why I've kind of downplayed personally, I, I don't think that the Comey uh, stuff necessarily did, uh, you know, all that much damage is because the reports were before the initial, before Comey reopened uh, everything so close to the election, Clinton was talking about going to Utah and Arizona and New yeah. Mexico and Texas to try to turn Texas blue. And it's like, so let's say the Comey thing never happened, right? And then let's also assume that it doesn't leak out, which is personally my theory that I think Comey came out and, and put it on an FBI letterhead because he was afraid of other people, of other agents leaking it, uh, that you're, being in Salt Lake was going to help Wisconsin, was going to help 
Michigan was going yeah. to help uh, Pennsylvania? Because I don't think so. I don't no. think that those union workers Dude, that stayed home were going to be helped. thrilled. I, don't think, I certainly don't think the, the FBI thing helped anything. No. It probably hurt. But I don't even think it's in like the top five reasons why Hillary lost that election. Like, I don't even think it's up there. I think there, there, are, a lot, there are a lot more of them. Yeah, uh, of bedrock problems. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, you've been very, very kind with your time to hang out here. Uh, uh, any final thoughts? Any final political thoughts that we didn't uh, we didn't have a chance to get to? Um, it's all about like I mean, we didn't really talk much about the how to move forward, uh, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I'm kind of it's it's depressing, and it's um, I it's it's hard not for me to get dismayed because I just don't even know <laughs> what to do, uh, and I still don't really know what specifically to do and i this is like a thing i've had a busy couple weeks with the sure. GHO stuff launching and so i haven't had as much time to like figure out my, my next like local political step as i'd like to but i mean honestly if i have to if i had to distill it down to like what the next big step is it's labor it's labor it's a meaningful labor movement within the united states and i think that's achievable because i think that you know, a lot of the people who need to be part of that labor movement, they voted against, you know, they voted against their, I hate saying that because I hate being this liberal coastal guy saying that's, people that's, vote against uh, their interests. Man, I, I'm glad that you have a problem. I, I, I hate, hate it. I hate it, but it's accurate. I hate that it's true. I don't, I, hate uh, I, I always have a problem with that just because it, it prescribes that the, the solution of the speaker will right. accurately diagnose the problem. Right. And right. so absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's, it's also not helpful rhetoric. No, right. <laughs> it's not helpful rhetoric at all. Because basically uh, it, it, it's, it's a high volutin way of saying dummy. I know better right? than you. I know better than you. Exactly. Right? Uh, Cause I live in LA. I know. Uh, it's like, it's an Andy Kaufman bit, right? Like it's not, it's not good politics. Exactly. I'm from he... Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, uh, even though a lot of those folks voted and I, here, I'll say it in a different way. Even though, even though a lot of those folks voted for a candidate who is going to be inherently anti-labor, right. In, in in his administration and the people he's putting in office, uh, those folks are still receptive to the message of labor, right? Which yeah. is of protecting the working class. It is of protecting the American working class. It is fair wages. It is, um, you know, meaningful employment. Um, it is a fair deal between the employee and the employer. These are the cornerstones of a labor movement. I think that that's the way forward. And it's not, and I think that there's this, I think that there's this unfortunate tendency to say to associate working class with manual labor and you know these the, the jobs like traditionally associated with unions and I think that's a problem that's that's a thing we need to fix because the same issue you know the you know the, the concerns of a coal miner are different from the concerns of a cubicle jockey right yeah. somewhere but uh, the solutions are similar right in terms of uh, worker protections and collective bargaining. And uh, unions, man, I, I think that's, I don't know, I think that's the way forward. And I, I think that unionizing more industries, uh, grassroots, and I mean, and this is the thing people say all the time, but grassroots and local uh, activism and, you know, and getting, you, you can't, you can't only care about politics every four years. You have, and I'm as guilty of this as everybody, but you have to care about it every year, every week. You have to care about it all the time and what it, what's going on in your community because that stuff trickles upward, you know? Well, I mean, uh, uh, this is something that I always wind up getting a lot of flack for because normally it, it, it's coupled with my opinion that you are allowed to not vote and a non-vote is is just as valid as anything else. And I agree. I agree. I agree. And I go so far as to say if you're uninformed, don't vote. <laughs> well, I don't, we don't. We don't want your opinion. If you don't, if you don't, if you're just guessing, don't don't vote. Don't well, go to the polls. And also, it's like I don't know. There, the, the 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 verbiage tends to frustrate me whenever it's like, oh, well, these people lost this candidate the election. It's like, since when was it on that dude? Like, since when was it on the the people in Michigan to like they're honor bound to put Hillary Clinton in office? No, it's Hillary Clinton's job to convince them to leave their house on a predetermined day, walk into a booth, and hit their button. It's dude, her look at fault. Hispanic voters. Look how many Hispanic voters voted for Trump. That mm -hmm. shit is bonkers. That's insane. Everybody just assumed, oh, he called Mexicans rapists. Mm, we've got the Hispanics. But it's like this, like it's a false, it's a false <laughs> assumption to say that, you know, any demographic is this like block that just does this this uniform block that does everything in unison. Well, and listen, it's it's ultimately a lesson that I think you 
will be will be well heated, hopefully, by other people running that, you know, you you need to be speaking for something and not just against something. And Absolutely. and that's, I think, something where if you look at how well Donald Trump did, Donald Trump understood that it's the economy, stupid. It's it's you know, it was it was that was the James Carville quote that won Bill Clinton in, you know, in 1992 and 1996 was the idea that like, hey, look, and this is why and we, we can go out on this. But this carrier thing, it's a dumb deal. It's something that from a free market perspective is is, you know, uh, I think a little dicey. They're going to be paying a, from a lot. From a business perspective, it's dumb. From, from a, a business, business perspective, perspective, it's dumb. However, however, it's great from marketing. from political theater and this is the kind of stuff where you know if, if if we're looking at it from the pro wrestling perspective what other president before they even get into office can has ever stepped up and said you get to keep your job walk up to somebody and, and put out your hand and say because i made a phone call you get to keep your job it's overpaying for it in a million different ways it sets a it troubling it president it was, pence. it was pence as governor like and it's overpaying it and a bunch of, and it and it sets a terrible precedent that other companies can be like oh we're thinking about going to mexico can we get some tax breaks too it's awful all around but i mean i'm as guilty as, as anybody it's like i you know i'm i'm pointing out all the stupid stuff about it but meanwhile how many jobs has bernie sanders saved you know i mean and, like, those... and, and, and i recognize that that's ridiculous but that is, but that's a way. That's something that people say. That's a, that's the way that people think. Uh, and for those of you who are just listening, after that last point by Aubrey Citizen, uh, you missed visually the double shrug emoji. So uh, I, I feel like that <laughs> is is the best Dude, possible watch it. way. Watch the video version. Just, very handsome men. Just two two shrug emojis uh, <laughs> right there side by side. Uh, Aubrey, where can people find more of what you do? Everything is on AubreySitterson.com, A-U-B-R-E-Y-S-I-T-T-E-R-S-O-N.com. You can find me on Twitter at Aubrey Sitterson. All my social media is Aubrey Sitterson. Things to check out every Thursday. I do straight shoot. Coming up on December 15th, your boy. Yeah. Just, Justin's coming on I'll straight on. shoot. We're going to be talking Raw. We're going to be talking SmackDown. Maybe NXT, maybe 205 Live. I haven't decided yet. Depends on whatever's interesting that week. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's a you know, it's it's a smart, educated, uh, but like you know, optimistic look at professional wrestling. It's uh, good. People it, will it's, like it. It's it's my uh, you know, when I was thinking because now I'm I'm doing this wrestling podcast now one uh, one nine hundred wrestling, and when I looked at the landscape, I under I wanted to understand okay, what are my favorite shows and why are they good? And what I really really appreciated about Straight Shoot is that there is this inherent kind of cynicism and like well look at how dumb these people are that are that are that are uh, you know uh, putting on this product that you very consciously uh, uh, avoid and it is what uh, in my opinion is the reason why a you get the guests that you do which are people that you know actually do it and number two is just a better way of analyzing the product that you are seeing and understanding That's, where where yeah. things are where you can use criticism, right? That's under. It's not like it's banned on the show. It's just you gotta you gotta separate what is your opinion and what you're latching onto and what you're actually watching. When people forget that criticism isn't just being critical, yeah. right? Uh, it's it's more difficult, but I think more important and more educational to talk instead of talking about stuff that sucks and why you don't like it to talk about what's good and what makes it good. Yeah, and so that's what we try. That's what we try and do on the show. Uh, that's straight shoot every Tuesday. A new episode is called. Uh, it's a sword and sorcery serial podcast. Uh, I write every episode for a year and a half now. Every single week, I write a new episode. I record it in one take. Each one's about thirty minutes long. It's psychotic. It's like you're um, a lunatic. I, you're you're an. I absolute, tell people. I've... I tell people it's like Conan as told by the Ultimate Warrior. It's very like nihilistic and violent and brutal. People should check it out. It's on all podcast platforms. It's called S K A L D. I've also started putting it up on YouTube. Uh, and I'm putting all the old episodes up there. I'm putting a new up episode up daily. The 31st episode just went up today. Uh, more will be up by the time this is live. Uh, so you can find it there as well if you prefer to listen on YouTube. And finally, G.I. Joe. Uh, yeah. I'm new, I, am, I am officially the most uh, insanely far left person to ever write To G. ever G. write G.I. Joe. Which I'm very excited about. Because uh, I'm going to be, I am going to be really laying in uh, all of the, but here's the thing, man. Uh, I think that, G.I. Joe should be written by a liberal progressive person because 
It is a book that's all about diverse people coming together, having fun, working hard, and fighting a monotonous, um, or a um, a uh, a homogenous homogenous. That's the word I was looking for. Homogenous fascist evil, right? It's people of all different races and creeds and uh, genders working together to fight Cobra, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm written G.I. Joe. Uh, the one shot that ties in with Revolution is out right now. The new, the number one, the new number one for the ongoing comes out December 28th. You can find it at all comic book shops and on comicsology.com if you want a digital version. Dude, very, very, very excited uh, to see you, uh, uh, you know, really sink your teeth into that title. I, I think you're you're perfect for it, and uh, I am I am very, very, very pumped to get my copy. Uh Aubrey, uh, uh, Aubrey Citizen on Twitter, right? Yeah, at Aubrey Citizen. Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, for you. joining us uh, here on the Politics, Politics, Politics show. Folks, if you want to email me, it is theyoungamerican at gmail.com. Uh, go ahead and uh, do that with uh, any of your questions. Uh, I, I know normally you guys can expect uh, of me to talk about the moments, you know, all the news of the week. I, I'll, I'll probably get a little mini episode out there just so we can do that and, and kind of answer any emails that are sort of time sensitive to the week. Uh, but I appreciate you guys uh, giving me this day off so I can travel across the country and watch my buddy get married. Uh, that is about it. Remember, folks. This is the uh, show where we all understand that some shows talk about politics, others talk about politics, still more talk about politics, but this is the only show that talks about all three. We will see you guys next week. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>